Hey, welcome or welcome back to Spellbound. I'm BJ the Book Witch and this is a recent reads wrap up. In this video, we're going to be looking at a spooky middle grade series, a contemporary YA series, a charming little middle grade, and one Peter Pan retelling. I have read so much over the past couple of months, and a lot of the books, most of the books, fall into some pretty cool categories that I'm going to be covering later this summer. Categories like new romances, adventures, pirates, mermaids, things like that. But I also wanted to do a video just talking about some of the really cool series and uh, individual standalone titles that I've read recently because I reached for them for a reason and I've got a lot to say. So first up is Empty Smiles by Katherine Arden. This is the fourth and I think final installment of the Small Spaces Quartet or Small Spaces series. So I love Katherine Arden. She's one of my favorite authors. The Baron, the Nightingale, and the entire Winter Night Trilogy is just some of the best writing ever in my opinion. And obviously this, the tone of this book, the writing is completely different. This is a middle grade series. It's a spooky series. For me, it is better than the Goosebumps series that I loved and read as a kid. This was such a great conclusion to that series while also leaving room perhaps for more in the future. But this whole series is just gives you that spine tingling kind of feeling as you read it. So the first book in this series is called Small Spaces. This book follows Ollie and her friends during a fall field trip through a cornfield where they encounter some sentient scarecrows. And it's it's so creepy. I have so, so much love for this book. I have read it so many times. And I think I've mentioned that I read in themes a lot, but sometimes if I'm really into a theme, it can kind of take over my life a little bit. And while I was reading this book, I was very into Scarecrows, which was weird, but it was also autumn. So like not totally off base, just real, real into scarecrows. I had decided to be a scarecrow that year for Halloween, spent weeks methodically pulling my outfit together. And I think to this day, my friends can still recall that time period and remember like how honestly annoying I must have been with the constant scarecrow content I was just providing to my friend group. And so this book really did it for me <laughs> because it's a creepy middle grade, a spooky middle grade all about scarecrows who used to be people. There is a villain in this series. We're introduced to him. He is known simply as the Smiling Man. He has a lot of connections to kind of the other side of the veil and he is the main adversary in all of these books. The second book is called Dead Voices and it has the, it follows the same group of friends, Ollie and her same pals, but this one takes place in winter and they are snowed into a cabin. It's kind of the kids versus ghosts in this haunted cabin and The Smiling Man. This book has one of my favorite creepy shit tropes and it is like the idea of being trapped on the other side of a mirror. Don't know, but that has always been like a deep fear of mine <laughs> and I think it's because I was first introduced to it in the Mary-Kate and Ashley movie Double Double Toil and Trouble. To this day, I'm still very unnerved by the idea of being trapped inside a mirror and this book has it, so this book delivers quality spooky middle grade. The third book in this series is called Dark Waters and follows the same group of friends as they take a tour with a couple of their parents over a haunted and isolated lake. So this book is very much your classic monster type of story. Of course, the smiling man is still very present. And of course, all of the adversaries in these books, the scarecrows, the ghosts, the um, monster, they're all somewhat otherworldly as well and so that's how the smiling man is able to kind of orchestrate these consistent attacks and um, he calls them games because the kids have to outsmart him every time and so this one is very creepy because like a monster can't be reasoned with it's super creepy i won't say that it has like a twist in it um but when you realize kind of what you're up against my stomach dropped it's it's good don't want to go on a lake for a while for sure. So the fourth and final book, Empty Smiles, takes place at a carnival. Plenty of creepy elements at a carnival anyway. Like they're just, what are they if not just haunt spots? The adversaries are not only the workers at this carnival, like the clowns, 
which are terrifying in their own right, but also there's kind of a backstory into the prizes that you can win. All the prizes that you can win at all of these carnival games are dolls, and there's something really eerie about the dolls as prizes. So this one is definitely the most cerebral is too big of a word to say it's a spooky middle grade but um it's it's like a mind game and so it again follows the same four kids but the three have to work together to save ollie in this one and ollie also has to prove herself unlike the Goosebumps series, these are not for standalones. They are meant to be read in a series because each character does have their own character arc and you can really see how their past kind of inform, informs the way that they approach the smiling man, the way that they approach their relationships with their parents, the way that they approach how they want to solve these problems, but ultimately they do all have to work together. Ollie's kind of the ling reader, the ringleader, but they all have their own strengths that they bring to this friend group in order to defeat the smiling man. Once again, quality spooky middle grade. I highly recommend this series. I think it's got a lot more depth and a lot more spook, especially compared to something a little bit flimsier like Goosebumps. And then I reread my very favorite contemporary YA series of all time, the Ashbury High series by Jacqueline Moriarty. I have been rereading this series since I first read it when I was 13. The entire series is like a comfort read for me and so I think that's why I've been reaching for it recently and it, like always, has delivered. For standalone-ish books and each one takes place a different year at Ashbury High which is a private preparatory high school in Sydney, Australia. And the entire series operates much like a teen drama like Degrassi where you, we get to know over four books a good dozen or so characters but each book focuses mainly on a few. And I don't mean this in the way that current or contemporary romance does this especially when you have siblings how each book kind of focuses on a different sibling and the other characters are maybe in a couple of scenes it's not like that. In these books, all of the characters are supporting characters and pretty active throughout the plot development at key plot points, but they aren't the main protagonists of each one. Feels really well developed. It really does feel very teen drama in that way. All of the books in this series are epistolary novels, which means that they're all made up entirely by correspondence. So letters, emails, memos, diary entries, notes left on the refrigerator, things like that. The first book in this series is called Feeling Sorry for Celia, and I think it won a lot of those sad teen book awards that they used to give out to sad teen books in the early 2000s, but I never really liked reading sad teen books, so I only read it the once and then don't own it anymore. But it is about a girl whose best friend runs away in the ninth grade to join a circus, and it deals a lot with mental health. I know a lot of my friends at the time really enjoyed this book. They really liked it. They put it in the same camp as Perks of Being a Wallflower, so I'm sure it was fine. I just don't remember it. I remember reading it and not thinking it matched the tone of the three other books of hers, which have a much lighter and sillier tone. So that's why I didn't like it. I didn't think it matched. The second book is called The Year of Secret Assignments, but the Australian title is Finding Cassie Crazy, and I prefer the Australian title because it has like 60 more pages at least to it. And I like that because it's like having the director's cut of like your favorite movie. Anyway, this book or these books follow three best friends as they begin a pen pal project with a rival school in Sydney. They each get paired with a boy from Brookfield, the public school across the way that is rumored to be full of criminals. And as soon as the letters start flying, chaos ensues. There's romance, betrayal, pranks, grief, bullying, a mystery to solve. And it also has this underlying vibe of that first time in high school when you really start to think about what your future is going to look like. So it has a lot of self-consciousness in it, a lot of self-discovery, and ultimately self-acceptance with a healthy dose of 10th grade angst. The third book is just absolute perfection, and it is The Murder of Bindi McKenzie. And Bindi McKenzie is the poster child for burnt out gifted kid. And that's because she is this extraordinarily brilliant, with zero self-awareness, annoying as shit, but beautifully endearing, perfectly ordinary teenager. And this book follows her in the 11th grade, which she claims is a person's most important uh, academic year in their entire lives, as the school that she attends 
creates an experimental class for 11th graders called Future and Development, called FAD for short, which Bindi hates. So Bindi causes this big stink about having to attend this class. She's extremely rude to her peers without meaning to, but she's not well-meaning either. Um, she's just this bull in a china shop of this academic kind of person. Her whole group can't stand her. They just, who who could? She is very hard to love. Because her no one in her group likes her, that is why she comes to believe that someone in her group is trying to kill her. This book is so special to me, so obviously I read it as a teenager and that's going to resonate. It's YA. Duh. But also, I read this book at such a specific time. So I was in the 8th grade, my brother was in the 11th grade, and I read this over spring break. And spring break in the 11th grade is typically when parents take their students to go tour colleges. And that's what we did. So that was going to be seven straight days of either road tripping in the car or touring college campuses. Either way, I was going to have my nose in a book. So I brought a huge stack of books, like a comical stack of thick books like this one. What's ironic is that there was only one college out of the four that I wanted to see, and it was you. UCF, the biggest, the biggest university in the country, that's where I wanted to go. And it is, in fact, where I ended up going and where Chris ended up going too. So it worked out, but that was the only one I even cared about seeing. But I didn't see much of that campus that day because the day that we got into Orlando, I started reading this book and that was it for me. So the entire day that we were touring the university that would eventually be my home for four years, I looked up from the page maybe five times. I truly, I did not engage with a single thing in my surroundings. I just walked on this tour and read this book in a blitz. And as soon as I finished it, I read it again. I paid zero attention to the entire city of what is now my home because this book was just it was just that good. It is hysterically funny and silly, but also very suspenseful. Um, it is about a murder plot and just so heartwarming and so, so full of coming of age wholesomeness. For any burnt out gifted kids out there, Bendy is your girl. The final book in this series takes a bit of a different tone because now the group at Ashbury are seniors. So there is a lot more angst, a lot more uncertainty about the future, a lot more bleakness and a lot more hope as well. It's very much that edge of a, edge of a cliff feeling, a lot more liminality, and it's called The Ghosts of Ashbury High. This book follows dual timelines, um, the seniors at Ashbury of present day, or what would have been present day 15 years ago, and the first generation of the UK criminals who were shipped down to Australia to like colonize the land. Because of the dual timelines, there are moments of magical realism in this book, but in my opinion, they only enhance the liminality and the overall vibe of the subtext of the whole book. What seniors are experiencing at the end of the year, you know, it's what are you moving toward? You don't know. And there's so much reality and groundedness in that very floaty feeling that I think having the moments of magical realism actually helped ground us a little bit more in reality, ironically or uniquely. So Jacqueline Moriarty is one of my favorite authors of all time, specifically because of this series. So I know that she's written um, and won many awards for her middle grade series, Bronte Metalstone and, and The Whispering Wars. And I know that she's written other YA series that have been majorly celebrated, like the A Tangle of Gold, A Corner of White or A Tangle of Gold or something. So I know, I know that she actually has more acclaimed works. She's also written an adult standalone in the past 10 years and she has another YA standalone called The Spellbook of Liss and Taylor, but the Australian title for that is I Have a Bed Made of Buttermilk Pancakes and I am obsessed with that book as well. But this series is so uniquely teenager. She has captured in four different ways the lenses and the stages that we go through as a teenager so perfectly. It is at times suspenseful, it's constantly angsty, but it's also really just a lot of silliness and a a lot of just that really riding the line of like some things are just nonsense and just accepting that but also some things are extremely serious at the time that become nonsense later and I think she just writes that so well. So this is the author I would say that has the, had the most impact on my own writing. I borrow from Moriarty's syntax constantly and the way that she writes things especially the way that she writes inner dialogue and inner nonsense. Love it. And I do promise that just because this series is now 15 years old does not make it irrelevant. And then I read Unhooked. Hang on. I gotta get this right. <laughs> 
Unhooked. Jesus Christ. I read this book, this one right here, Unhooked by Lisa Maxwell. So this is a Peter Pan retelling and it's a Peter Pan retelling that I was not able to get to last year when I did my Peter Pan retellings wrap up, much like right here. But this book follows Gwen and she's lived her whole life on the run but doesn't know why. So her mother is super paranoid, super superstitious and they have been packing and unpacking their whole lives, running from something. But one night, Gwen is snatched up and taken to a strange new world full of danger as shadows and monsters and dangerous fae and there she has to decide who to trust a violent pirate or a kind boy who has secrets of his own so this book was well written it was well paced the perfect kind of retelling if you are just obsessed with exactly the original plot of peter pan you just want more of it that's what this book did well but that's also why i didn't love it or connect to it because i think that peter pan some of my favorite peter pan retellings were ones that really took it in a new direction i think that's what i wanted peter pan is an intense sad story and you can take that in many different ways in a retelling. You can provide so much commentary on the original story, or you can just write a new story with the same characters and just add a twist. But this didn't feel like Peter Pan with a twist. It just felt like Peter Pan with more world building. So if you are like, actually, the story of Peter Pan is perfect and I want no one to mess with it. I just want more of it. I want more lore. I want more enchantment, more world building. I want to see and interact with the characters more. Here you go. I mean, this book is, then this book is perfect for you. It is still worth reading, I think, if you just enjoy retelling. And obviously it's not the cartoon and obviously it's not the children's play, but um, the overall beats are the same. I don't remember what I rated it. Honestly, it would have been somewhere between a three and four star, but I think me not liking it truly comes down to personal preference. And finally, I read Bob by Wendy Mass. This is a charming little middle grade about a girl who returns to her grandmother's home in Australia after being gone for five years. And when she returns, she finds Bob, a strange creature in a chicken outfit hiding in her old closet. And when she's with Bob, old memories start coming to the surface about what may have happened the last time she was here. I know that that description sounds ominous. I promise this is not like a child trauma kind of book. It's not sad like that. It is extremely sweet and very cozy and very happy. I promise you'll like it. Um, it's a super cozy, fantastical middle grade and I rated it five stars. So that's what we have today. Two series and two standalones. If you've read any of these, please let me know down below. And if not, then let me know what you have been reading recently, or let me know what YA standalone or YA series had the biggest impression on you as a teenager. And then if you liked this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you loved it, hit subscribe. And of course, there's always Instagram. But take care, and as always, happy reading.